Well, thanks everybody. Um, I've been doing these OWL presentations for I think around 10 years. And, um, just a little bit of background. So I started my career off working for the Forest Service after I got out of undergrad college um, where I was working in Arizona with the Mexican spotted owl. Um, and that was in the early 2000s. Um, and that's the cousin of the northern spotted owl, which was, had a lot of debate um, that was happening in the late 90s um, up in the Pacific Northwest. So for three years I worked for the Forest Service and I was out looking and studying um, and collecting a lot of data and a lot of repro repro uh, reproductivity data on Mexican spotted owls because um, they were an endangered species down there um, in Arizona and they were an old growth obligate species meaning they needed really old growth forest down there. Um, so that kind of set the stage for me for how I, I started to get introduced into actually doing work and research with owls. But I think like going even further back when I think of kind of my first memory of, you know, where did I first become fascinated by owls myself? And I grew up in New Hampshire, I mean, maybe about an hour north of here on the Connecticut River. And I remember canoeing with my father one summer down by the river and all of a sudden we just saw this giant bird swoop over the river, land in a tree, and it just started hooting away. Um, my father explained to me that it was a great horned owl and it really embedded uh, that, that memory um, for a long time, I mean even to this day. Um, and it was, so, it, it was so captivating and so awestruck to me that uh, you know, I've never forgot it and I think that a lot of people have a lot of similar experience to, this, to that and part of what I'm going to talk about tonight is why people are so fascinated with owls. Why we have such a connection with them. That was the owl in the passage I read. The great horned owl. Yeah. 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 Ubo. Um, so I think throughout time and throughout cultures, people have really loved owls. Um, and th that's why I keep thinking that every time I do one of these presentations, that I'm like, wow, nobody's going to show up. But then it's like packed. And it always blows me away. Um, and so, well, let me just go ahead and begin. Oh, let me digress. So after I worked for the Forest Service, um, just to kind of set up the, that I'm somebody that actually knows a little bit about owls, um, I wound up doing my graduate research on barred owls just up in Cheshire County, New Hampshire. So I was looking at habitat utilization of barred owls in that area. So I spent a lot of time out in the middle of the night, this time of year, um, looking and calling for owls and trying to find out where exactly they were on the landscape. And then looking at different landscape features and trying to figure out um, which of these landscape features these owls were relating to and why they were in certain places and why they weren't. Um, so it was a pretty fascinating look into it and one thing that you realize as you're doing research into certain wildlife populations is you realize actually how little research there is out there. And owls is actually one of these groups of, of bird species that there, isn't, there is a body of research but there isn't a ton of it out there. Um, so there's still a whole world of mystery that we don't even know about with these birds. So, as I kind of explained initially, why are owls so fascinating? Well, I think kind of the first thing about it is they look like us. <laughs> they kind of have these human-like characteristics, so, you know, eyes in the front, a, a beak that looks like a nose, and so when we look at them, we can kind of relate to them just on that level that, hey, you know what, they kind of look like us. They really stick out among other birds. So anybody, whether a kid or an adult, you know, they can see a whole different flock of birds and if there's an owl in it, they can point them out because of these distinct features that they have. You have other animals that try to copy characteristics of owls. So you have these, let me see if this will work, the polyphemus moth up here with these two big eyes right here, right there too. And then you have these garden balls that people put out with these big eyes. And those are kind of supposed to represent somewhat of the owl eye, but to scare off um, predators that say would either eat the moth or go into the garden and eat the food that's in there. Um, and then you have this girl here that's probably not trying to scare anybody, but wanted to dress up for, like as an owl for Halloween. So owls have been in human mis- and our history all over the world. So here we have an Egyptian owl, we have a Native American owl, and here's Athena, the Greek goddess of war, and her owl, um, which I believe her, the name of her owl was Bubo, 
Um, and if you look at the, the genus and the species name of the great horned owl, its genus is Bubo. Um, I believe the Inuit, they have a story, one of their cultural stories is about how the short-eared owl came about. So all over the world, it's just not in the United States, but everywhere, people have this intense fascination with, with owls. And obviously we find owls in our own pop culture here in America from, I, I kind of outdate date myself here. If anybody remembers this, the, the uh, Tootsie Roll lollipop, how many licks does it take to get to the center of the owl? Here's Woodsy, Woodsy Owl, uh, give a hoot, don't pollute. Um, Harry Potter, something a little bit more contemporary. And then uh, there's uh, Clash of the Titans, if anybody remembers that movie from back in circa 1980, maybe. Um, and again, the owl in there um, uh, was named Bubo. Um, owls and human evolution. So this right here is a drawing of an owl from some of the first human drawings that ever occurred 30,000 years ago. So, and this is in, I can't pronounce the name of the cave, but it was in France where some of the first um, human drawings were discovered. Um, and the one fascinating thing about this drawing here, this owl, which um, some experts believe was a long-eared owl, is that they actually drew the owl with its head turned around looking over its back. So obviously a really fascinating characteristic that even uh, ancient human beings were so captivated by that the earliest drawings that man ever did showed an owl, but also showed something really unique about it, how its head can turn around almost you know, 360 degrees around it and look over its back, and that that's the way they wanted to draw it. So at least for 30,000 years, and I'm sure longer, people have been fascinating, fascinated by owls. And of course we have the geeky scientist view that owls are large predatory animals having a high metabolic rate and <coughs> consequence high demand for food in the form of prey species that are often captured with a high degree of skill, hence their ecology is of special interest. Ooh. <laughs> it's true. So evolutionary ecology. So what is the kind of the family history of owls? Where are they, who are they related to and where do they come from? Um, they have the largest fossil record of all living birds, but actually their closest relatives, a lot of people think it's the hawks, but they're actually related to the Capra forms, which are the night hawks and the night jars. Um, the relationship with hawks is just a relationship of something that they would call, um, where they both develop similar evolutionary adaptations, meaning like a beak and wings, but it was like a convergent evolution effect. They didn't develop it because they were related to each other. They developed it in relation to the stressors of the environment on them through natural selection. So it's kind of like an owl has wings and a bat has wings, but they're not related. They both can fly, but they're not related. They develop these features in relation to the environment um, and, the, and the adaptations that they developed over time. So here's just some general owl morphology. So, which is basically just some aspects kind of, um, I guess, uh, visual aspects of owl or characteristics on the outside of owl that uh, are all common uh, amongst them all. So they all have this cryptically colored plumage. Um, obviously, they want to have camouflage, so if they're hiding somewhere and they need to pounce on prey, um, they do not want to be visible by anything, say, a, a mouse or a squirrel or even a small bird. They may be able to, to detect them. Um, the females are larger than the males. That's called reverse sexual dimorphism. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the females are the main brood rearers. They're having the eggs, and so they need to be a little bit bigger to be in the nest and to try to defend the young from any potential predators that could be in there. <coughs> they have large brains. This is probably one of the main outstanding characteristics of owls. So if you look at this right here, you just see an owl is basically a bunch of feathers and a huge brain and a beak. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why they have such a large brain. And then one of the real characteristics that I think that everybody recognizes is this large facial disc. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but just think of that facial disc as kind of like a satellite dish 
that focuses in all the sound that's coming in. So silent flight, this is a real, uh, another, just like the brain, the silent flight adaptation that owls have is truly characteristic um, amongst all other birds out there. So owls have this kind of downy-like, and I'll pass some feathers around so people can feel it, they have this downy-like covering on tops of their feathers. And what that does is, think of the bird, and if anybody's actually been a, a, heard a bird flying above them, like say like a crow or a duck, you can hear those wings beating, you can hear it. <coughs> now if you're trying to go down and like pounce on a paramiscus mice or a squirrel or even another bird, you don't want them to be able to hear that because then they're going to hear it and they're going to get out of the way. Well, owl, owls have developed this velvety down, or like this flocking that's on their feathers, so when their wings are flapping and the feathers are moving over each other, you can't hear anything at all. They also have these serrated edges on the leading tip of their primary wing feathers, which is, would be the wing feather right here, and it'd be kind of the first feathers right there. So as the wind is hitting it, and it's hitting that serration, it's moving the air current over it, but it's breaking up these noise vortices that naturally occur on a more smooth wing bird, so like a crow or a turkey. So you have the velvety covering on the feather, and then you have a serration in the leading edge of the primary wing feather, both working in concert to break up the noise to allow that, uh, that owl to fly down silently and grab its prey. Um, and I'll pass actually a couple of these around so people can actually see them. And both of these are um, from barred owls, and both of them are, I don't know if this is the leading ridge of the primary feather. You can somewhat see the serration on that one. It's not as deep. This one's a little bit deeper, but you can really feel the velvety down on it. And you brush it across your face on your skin, you'll feel how soft that is. Um, and then compare this with that this is a, a wing feather from a turkey, and compare that feather the owl feathers, and you really see the difference between the two. Yeah, those are yeah please. Yeah. I guess we can start here and pass them around. Yes, sir. And that's why oftentimes, like out in the woods, owls tend to surprise people because they're sitting down there, and next thing you know, they turn around, and there's two eyes looking right at you, and you didn't even hear the bird come in. So, owls and vision. And we'll go in a little bit about hearing. Vision is kind of well, I guess for some of the owls, it'd be number one for how they find their prey and maneuver around. Um, hearing often is, in, in my opinion, is number one, but you can't discount uh, their vision on this at all. So one thing about owls compared to a lot of other birds out there is they have frontally oriented eyes, just like people. So that gives you binocular vision and allows you to assess depth. Um, so especially when you're trying to go down and capture a piece of prey, you need to kind of assess how far it is away from you with a high degree of accuracy to be able to go down there and grab it. Um, most bird species don't have that. Like if you think of a woodcock that has an eyeball on each side of the head, it has a lot of vision. It can see all around it in case a predator's coming down, but it ha doesn't have very good way, uh, a very good way to actually assess depth. Um, uh, another bird like a Canada goose, or like a duck, it's the same way. Their eyes are on the, much more on the outside of the head. And that's why when you see them flying, you'll often see them turn their head quite a bit. And they're doing that. That's how most birds try to assess distance and depth is by they have to move uh, their head back and forth, back and forth to actually be able to judge that distance. Now for an owl, that wouldn't work very good when your main uh, modus of catching prey is to be silent and to be still is if you're moving your head back and forth, back and forth like that, your prey is going to be able to see you. Thus, having frontally oriented eyes decreases that ability of, of them moving their head back and forth as they're either flying down or on a branch to be able to catch prey, and it allows them to better assess the depth of that prey too as well. Um, and that's why you see these large eye sockets right here on each side of that skull. Owls and hearing. Now, this is really the coup de grace of what I think makes owls so absolutely fascinating, is their ability to hear. So, as I talked about earlier, oops, as I talked about earlier, owls have these large facial discs right here. And just like a satellite dish, and if you cup your ears, it acts the same way. It's meant to funnel all the sound in towards its face, 
And then it, the, the way the feathers are structured in here, it funnels the sound, it, the sound hits the face, and then it's funneled into the ear, which is on each side of the head. And so here's the ear opening right there, you can see on that owl. Um, so they're about right here, right there. And if you, I think most people have probably done this if you've ever been outside, where you hear something and it's kind of distance away and you're trying to figure out where it comes from. Well, we can't move our ears, but if you ever stick your hands behind your ears like that and then you move it around to try to like center where exactly that sound is coming from. And that's what that large facial disc on an owl actually does. It grabs that sound, pushes it towards the ear, and it allows the owl to know, really precisely start to hone in on where that prey is. And so, when we talk about hearing, they get, the owls get the sound, it comes into the ears, but how are they know where that prey is, say, up and down vertically or horizontally? Well, horizontally, meaning, you know, from left to right, how an owl determines where that prey is, is they use something called uh, binaural time lag, which is basically they can detect the difference that it takes the sound to reach their left ear before it reaches their right ear, or vice versa. So we're talking 150, 150 of a second difference. So they can tell with a high degree of accuracy. I mean, you, you think about a mouse that's, say, 30 yards away, under the snow, it's making a sound, the owl's there on the branch, and it has the ability to know with a high degree of accuracy when it gets that sound, whether it's coming from the left or the right. I mean, even if the owl's looking at it just slightly off to the right, say it's a couple inches away, they can tell that because of that time difference that the sound reaches one ear versus the other, they know that that prey species is to the left. So they can detect if the sound hits the right ear first, it's to the right. If it hits the left ear first, it's to the left. Pretty amazing. So we talked about the horizontal plane, or left to right. Now how do they tell where it is, where the prairie species is up or down in the vertical plane? They use that by, uh, the, not the difference in time that it takes the sound to reach one ear versus the other, but it's actually in the sound intensity. See, the owl has uh, offset ears, meaning that the, on one side of the head, the ear opening is higher than on the other side of the head where it's lower. So unlike our ears, which are symmetrical, and owls are asymmetrical, meaning that they have one, the opening is higher on one side of the head versus the other. So that's how when an owl hears a sound, and on the right ear that has the higher ear opening, the sound is more intense than that one, the owl knows that the, that the sound of that prey species is higher up in the vertical plane. If the sound intensity is higher in the left ear that has the lower ear opening, then the owl can detect that that prey is lower. So pretty amazing that these minute differences in sound, I mean, this is something that us as human beings, we can't even come close to it. It's like how like a dog can smell like 10,000 different smells and maybe we can only smell the one Yankee candle that's burning in the corner and that's it. Um, owls are processing these things and these are, and the, the, the fact is they're also picking out all the other different sounds that are out there. So if you're out there at night, it's not always very quiet, especially if you think of like late summer where all the sounds that are out there. So they're peeling through all the layers of the different sounds hone down on that one sound that they know is, say, a white-footed mouse that's scurrying underneath the leaves. Most of the time, I shouldn't say most of the time, but often a lot of their prey that they're going after may not be visibly in the open. Right now, they're underneath the snow. Sometimes they're underneath the leaves. And they're hearing that, they're adjusting where they think that prey item is, either if it's hitting the right ear first, they know it's to the right. If the opening on the right side of the head is getting the higher intensity sound, they know it's a little bit up, and they're focusing right on that. So they're continually honing it down until they pretty much can get an idea of where that prey species is. And granted, it's, we're not talking like feet away from it, we're probably talking definitely 
10, 20, 30 yards away from uh, some of these birds. So that sound, and this is why they have such a big brain, that sound <coughs> is trans, uh, translated into the brain where they make this basically a 3D map of auditory space. So they're making a map based on all these sounds in there and figuring out where it is on the landscape, where that prey species is. And then they're honing it in, flying down, and then grabbing the mouse or the squirrel or the rabbit um, with a high degree of accuracy. And if you think about it, say something like a barred owl, which is probably about that big, and then you have a mouse like that, that's like a couple inches. If you missed a lot, you're not gonna make it. And the abundance of owls that we have around here, I think speaks to the fact that, yes, they do miss, but they get, they get them a lot more than they miss them. <laughs> So the innards of owls. So owls don't have uh, crops to store food in like other birds do. They actually eat their prey whole um, and then they chuck up the, the pellets, the undigestible parts that they can't uh, digest, so the bone fragments and some of the fur um, and other pieces that are in there. And scientists use that to be able to look at prey analysis. So you can break those apart and actually see the different prey species that they're eating, um, say, in different regions of the country or for different <coughs> owl species. So that's one thing that, say, a researcher would look into if, you know, say they thought that there was a decrease in owls or the population was going down, maybe it'd be a food issue, something that was going on in there, you'd actually see what they were eating. Um, and, and by analyzing the pellets, um, you can actually see what type of fauna that is that they're, that they're feeding on, and then subsequently you could probably do some research on on the prey items and see how many of them are around. And if they're decreasing, then sometimes the owl will decrease too. Um, and you kind of find that with some owls and uh, with um, their reproduction is, I believe, like especially like the snowy owl, they're really tied into say lemming populations, which is a small mammal like a mouse. Um, and they small mammal populations like that tend to usually have um, big population increases and then they drop. So what they would call cyclical. They have high years and then they have low years, and the owl populations respond to that, or their reproductive rates actually respond to that. So in years where there's a high abundance, they have a lot of young. In years of low abundance, they don't have that many, and oftentimes you'll see um, big it, uh, eruptive flights of, say, owls that will come down into, say, this part of like New England, especially this time of year, um, if some of their prey species are really uh, low up north um, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it actually has to do with seed crop too um, for certain tree species. So the small mammals would feed on the seeds and if the seed crop is bad that year, the small mammal population is low. Um, thus the owls are moving out of town to come to, come to better, better hunting grounds. So breeding, an owl's uh, breeding, their, their reproductive cycle is triggered by um, changes in daylight, a hormonal response in it, and changes to what we would call photo period. Uh, meaning that as daylight is increasing or decreasing, that's telling them that hormone is increasing in their body, signaling them for, to start um, initiating nesting um, and to start initiating uh, having young. Uh, most owls are monogamous, meaning that they mate for life, so they get a pair, they stay with that one forever. Um, if one of them dies, they'll pick up another one, um, but pretty much they're, they're solitary. Unlike our songbirds, which kind of fly down to South America and Central America, they come up in the spring and they find a mate for that summer, and then they break up and they do it all over again. Um, owls aren't like that. Um, owls stay together pretty much for life. And most owls don't construct nests. Um, they'll use, cat a lot of the ones around here are cavity nesters. Now you will see great horned owls using, say, great blue heron nests or uh, crow nests, but they're never actually going out there and grabbing material and constructing a nest like we see with like most birds or something like a robin. Um, and the majority of ones here in New England are predominantly cavity nesters. They're using holes created by a woodpecker or a piece of rot that happened when a branch broke off of a tree. Um, so I'm just going to go into um, kind of our main owl species that we have here in New England, um, starting with the uh, king daddy of them all, the great horned owl, um, Bubo virginianus, which is the biggest owl, and it's the biggest owl in North America by weight. 
Um, oftentimes you look at the great gray owl, which in size is bigger, but that just has, the great gray just actually has way more feathers in it because it has to withstand those uh, cold temperatures of the north. Um, but the great horned owl by weight is one of the biggest ones. Uh, it's the biggest owl that we have here in North America. And they're found all throughout North America, um, as I have up here from Alaska all the way down to the southern tip of South America. And that really speaks <laughs> to this owl's high adaptability um, to all sorts of different environments, and it's a real efficient predator too as well. Um, you'll find these, especially around here, I tend to find great horned owls a lot more in say areas like here in Northfield where you have kind of like a mixed use setting of agricultural fields, forests, um, and then you'll find them also in suburban areas too as well. Um, really generalist, um, kind of like our red tail hawks, you'll find them all over the place. Um, extremely efficient predator, um, has been known I think to swipe small dogs and house cats. And I think somebody even told me some ridiculous story of one that they, they heard tried to like steal some baby on like Cape Cod or somewhere. I, I kind of discounted that one, but um, it was kind of, you know, kind of funny. As long as it wasn't serious, I don't think that did have. Oh. I didn't think the, uh, the volume was going to work. Here we are. So that's a pair of great horned owls. With the classic, uh, who's awake? Me too. And you'll hear the, the difference between that and the, uh, and, the, and the barred owl. So my favorite right here, the barred owl, um, found all over Massachusetts, pretty much everywhere. Um, they do require large, expansive, unfragmented uh, pieces of forest land. So large areas, kind of like what we have here in Northfield and what we have here uh, in western Massachusetts. Um, I'm finding them all over the place. Um, they are a cavity nester. Unlike the great horned owl, which will nest in great blue heron nests and, and crow nests, the barred owl is a strictly a cavity nester. And because of its size, it actually requires a naturally formed cavity. Um, oftentimes, even the ones that are made by the pileated woodpecker are not big enough. So oftentimes, you're going to find them nesting in a cavity that, say, like a branch on like a tree, especially like sugar maples. I find that to be uh, just a classic uh, barred owl nesting site because you have uh, sugar maples tend to get these big branches that shoot off of them, and then they break off, and it's a great avenue for rot to get into the tree, and you get these great cavities that come in here. Um, probably didn't have a lot of these around. Um, in the mid-1800s due to uh, the extreme amount of pasture land we have around here and really a decrease in the amount of mature uh, forest land that we had around here, um, which the owl needed for, uh, for its nesting structures. Um, but nowadays you find them everywhere as the forest has come back and matured and they're, and they're quite a bit all over the place. In fact, they're now a problem now in the, uh, oops, they're now a problem now in the Pacific Northwest and as I kind of talked about earlier about some of the work I did with the Mexican spotted owl, well, it's northern cousin to northern spotted owl um, in Washington, Oregon, and northern California, which is a, an endangered species and no growth obligate. Um, what has happened is the barred owl has moved into its territory now, and it's a much more aggressive owl um, than the northern spotted owl is, and they're finding that, that they're, they're wind up predating on the northern spotted owl um, and killing them. And so it's created this really awful conundrum for biologists out there who are trying to save this one iconic endangered species and now they're having this other owl that's coming in um, through, I think they believe that through um, a lot of planting of trees, especially like in the Midwest and shelter belts and things like that, the owl has progressed its way out there and moved in, um, but it, now they have this issue where there's all these barred owls, they're killing this endangered species, this other owl, and I think in some states they actually had programs where they're coming in and actually removing the barred owls in there in order to try to save uh, the northern spotted owl. So a terrible uh, situation to actually have to be in where you have to remove one species that um, it is a native species, wasn't native to that area, but is now compromising uh, an endangered species that's really on the brink of phasing out. It's just kind of, it's kind of just sad. I hate to 
has to be the guy that's got to do that. Um, but Barred Owl obviously gets its name from the barring you see here uh, on its chest and then even some on its neck. And this is a classic owl that I think everybody knows, the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all that we, that we see out there. Um, you know, just a beautiful owl. I mean, and, and actually their calls are, go way beyond the who cooks for you. They have this repertoire of sounds that just blows your mind from blood curdling caterwauling that the pears will do. Um, to kind of they have this like I call it kind of like monkey howling that'll go off, and each you know each pair I ever came across, they all seem to have their unique um, kind of vocal signature. Some would kind of be low and down deep. Some of them would trill at the end, um, and I I really kind of wanted to study and look at you know if you could actually identify an individual by its vocal signature. Um, I never got into that, but I always thought it would be fascinating because I think you could. Um, and let's see, hopefully this uh, audio will work here. Oh, that one doesn't. I don't know what that is. You want me to try it from the back? There we are. <laughs> sure everybody's heard this? Yeah. <laughs> Especially this time of year, mm -hmm. they're just going—they're going off the wall. I've been—I've been—I've been out in the woods a lot, uh, especially since from October till now, and and they've just been really increasing it up. Because right now in the winter time is we're really getting into the owl breeding season, so they're really um, vocalizing quite a bit. And so, like with most owls, and uh, you know, using the barred owl as an example, um, <clears throat> the barred owl is territorial meaning they have their set territory around an area. Um, and Barred Owl, their territory is about a square mile, which is just under 650 acres, kind of give or take. Um, and so typically they're going around that territory and they're calling to announce to all the other owl, owls out there, hey, you know, this is my territory. Um, they're also calling to what they would call to pair bond with like the female that they're with. So it's kind of like saying I love you, like they're just solidifying their relationship with each other. And that's often when you start to hear that caterwauling, where one of them starts hooting and hooting, and the other one's like, wah, 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 and they just will go off the wall. And people are like, what is that crazy sound? It sounds like somebody's getting murdered out in the woods. You know, at first I thought it was an owl, but it's like blood curdling. Um, but that's what it is, it's, typically, it's the barred owl out there, and uh, um, they're just getting ready to, ready to ha have some young. Um, and typically they have about two or three young, depending on how much prey they can get. Um, this year may, may wind up being a little bit tough for them um, with all the <coughs> snow that we got early on, but um, I don't know. New, New England's always had harsh winters and the owls have always made it through, so I think they'll probably do all right. The northern sawwet owl, um, beautiful owl. Um, sawwets are migratory, they'll move through. Um, and actually, that's, this is one owl species that they've been doing a lot of research on. Um, especially migratory studies and looking at them and, and they can actually mist net them um, and capture them at night and then look at them and band them and study them and um, see how, which ones are moving through, how many of them are, and they're doing a, a quite a bit of research uh, on these owls. Um, cute little owl, small, not that big, about like that, um, but if you're a paramiscus mice, you better look out because they're pretty efficient. Um, really, really cool efficient killer. We actually had uh, solid owls out in Arizona too. Um, and you find them, again, in, especially in areas, the same type of habitat that you would find barred owls in, too, as well. Um, I don't tend to hear them as much, barely as much as I do barred owls, and I think that probably just because barred owls are way more vocal um, than some of these other owl species that we have are. Um, they're out there, but it, it, you just don't see them that much. Um, but yeah, our smallest owl here in Massachusetts are really cute guys, got those great big yellow eyes. See if I can get his sound to play. Sounds like a piece of heavy equipment backing up. <laughs> it's not your neighbor with his front end loader backing up. <laughs> and they'll use that when they're do when they're um, banding them. They're using these nets and they're doing it in the fall during their migration. They're playing that call, and so the owls come in. They hit the net. They get caught in it. And then the researchers go out, they get them out of the net, they weigh them, um, they'll pull, sometimes they're taking blood samples out of them, and they're taking feather samples out. 
um, and then they band them. Like this one right here is banded. You can see it's uh, aluminum band right there on its leg, and then they let them go. Um, and then they hopefully will be able to recapture it at some point down on the line and actually get an idea of where these owls are coming from and, where, and how they're moving through. The Eastern Screech Owl, um, another cool owl. It has all these different coloration phases from kind of this red right here to the gray up here and then more model look down there. Really just a fascinating owl. One of the most com our most common owls that we find around here and one of the most common breeding uh, birds of prey that we have here in Massachusetts too. Rural, suburban. I tend to find these in agricultural areas quite a bit. So say like a place like here in Northfield. Like if I was down in some of the cornfields or whatnot around here, that's where I tend to hear these quite a bit. I don't, know, I don't hear them out in the woods in like the deep timber that much at all. Um, it tends to be, they, they, at least to me, they seem to prefer these agricultural fields. Um, and I'm always surprised that I don't hear them as much as I would think that I would. And you know, I'm out in the early morning, you know, I'm out late at night, um, either for work or uh, whatever I'm doing, and I don't, I don't hear them that much. Do you hear them that much, Nick? No. <laughs> I don't either. They claim to be the most common, but I do hear them, but not as much as, I, as uh, I'd like to. But one, really cool bird. One time, Tom, I was out and I was imitating the call of the screech owl, and all of a sudden I was attacked. Barred owls. Oh. And I said, my God, I never knew they fed on screech owl. <laughs> but that sure was an indication that they thought I was a screech owl. Yeah, well, that, that's why they, um, they, when they have protocols like that when they're doing multi-species uh, owl inventory. So say like Citizen Science, I know Maine has one of these. When people are out and they're trying to just see what owls are around, there's a sequence that they do the calls from the big owl to the small one just for that oh. aspect because they don't want to actually call in the small owl and then subsequently have the small owl there as they're calling in the bigger owl that's actually going to prey on the one there and actually potentially like kill it. Um, I was with a group and we had, we had been trying to call a barred owl in with the barred owl call. But. Oh, yeah. They, and, you know, and, but that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, owls really are... Um, you can actually bring them in quite easily um, with these calls because of their territorial nature that they are, especially um, the barred owl, which is, is the most vocal. Um, so you can, can go out there and play the call of the owl, and probably within 20 minutes or less, you should be able to get a response if they can hear you. Um, obviously, with that facial disc, they're, they're really amazing ability to hear. They can actually <clears throat> hear that sound from quite a distance away. Um, I, I was pretty amazed. I mean, when I was doing my graduate research, research you'd get to these places and, you know, you'd be waiting and waiting. Um, you know, it'd be in the middle of the night, it'd be like 2 in the morning, I'd be blasting this barred owl call. I, I'm lucky I never had anybody call the police on me, um, some of the places I was in. And you'd be waiting, and of course, with their silent flight, you can't hear them fly in. And next thing you know, it'd be like 19 minutes, you'd be waiting, and then you'd have this owl right there would just start going crazy, like calling at you. Um, oftentimes they would fly in first to kind of check it out, to kind of see what, what you were doing, and then they would just start calling again. So they, they do respond to it. Um, we try to encourage people, especially like as we're getting like into the nesting season, to not be calling, doing playback for the owls that much, because obviously you're pulling them off their nests, and then, you know, there's chances of predation um, in the cavity and, and predation of, uh, you know, or the young could, you know, say freeze or, you know, uh, starve to death. But there's just some kind of danger in that, you know, so we encourage people not to like, I know you didn't overdo it, but to uh, not go out there and like call them every night and just so you can actually see it. I just might follow up quickly with that. There, I don't know how many of you have ever seen it, but you, you can buy a little booklet that has, um, what do you call all those little lines? And you can run a wand across it and it will give the bird song. The National and Massachusetts Audubon Society is now saying no one should use them. Oh. For the very reason you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, because they were calling birds. I mean, they're so good. They're calling birds in, and it was disturbing their normal patterns and habitats. And so yeah. On. It, it, it is something that, you know, people have to be aware of just because, especially with birds like these, they're not, they're not in high densities, um, unlike some of our songbirds, which would have, an, uh, you know, uh, territory of an acre. I mean, a barred owl has 
you know, 650 acres out there. So there's not a lot of them that are out there on the landscape. And so an impact to say a bird that has that big a territory and they have two young, they lose two young, um, you know, that, that's, that's fairly significant. Um, but, um, you know, it's just something to think about. People have to kind of be careful about that when they're out there, you know, because everybody wants to hear them. And so it is tempting to go out there and, and, and make the calls and, uh, um, and get the bird and check it out. That's what, screech owl, the horse whinny. <laughs> you hear that call a lot in movies? Like if they're in a swamp somewhere, some like dangerous swamp, they're always playing the screech owl in the background. And that's how you know when you're a birder when you're like calling stuff out in the movies. You're either saying, that bird wouldn't be there. You got that wrong. Had that wrong. Oh, they often yeah. do. And then your significant other's like, oh, looking at you like, oh, you're cheap. Did you just quit? <laughs> Nerd. The long-eared owl. Uh, another really cool bird. Long-eared owl, um, along with, I'll go in next, is a, the shorty owl. These are really birds of open areas. Um, they are kind of the hovering and gliding. Uh, owls, meaning that they're not so much in the woods where they're really hunting is big open fields. They have big long wings and you see them flying, you know, like five feet off the deck, five feet off the, you know, the meadow, just flying through there, trying to like move that facial disc and hone in on prey and pounce in on it. Um, there's species of special concern here in Massachusetts and a lot of that has to do with because we in Massachusetts don't have a lot of large grasslands. Um, most of the grasslands we have here um, are smaller hay fields and not like the large expanses that we need, um, or, or these owls need. And where I found, where I've come across them before, kind of more locally around here, is down at the uh, Northampton Airport, um, mm -hmm. down in those big grasslands and, and farm fields down there along the Connecticut River. Um, and and I'm trying to think what it was. Maybe it was like five years ago I was down there because um, there happened to be a, a long eared owl down there. Here's a call along here. Oh, maybe I don't have that in there. Well, it's not that interesting anyway, so <laughs> it's not like the barred owl. I mean, it's just not that cool. And so I kind of get near the end when I'm trying to talk about owls is really also to kind of convey a little bit about habitat to, keep to folks, um, because all, all wildlife species need uh, good habitat depending on, you know, uh, well, what type of species they are. But not all, what looks good to, some, to people isn't necessarily always good for the wildlife. So just because we see stuff there doesn't necessarily mean it's a good place for them. And oftentimes I would see that a lot in a lot of birding posts I'd be on. People would be like, oh, I saw this bird there. You know, I saw that bird there. And, you know, and I knew where these areas were. And you'd be going, oh. God, that's terrible habitat. It's just, you know, that bird really shouldn't be there. It's too bad. Because if you look at the surrounding landscape around it and really start to understand that just because that bird's there, it may not be a great place for them. There could be mittens here that's out <laughs> killing all the birds. There's roads hitting the birds. There's a high abundance of small mammals squirrels, chipmunks, big nest predators of birds. So all these factors kind of combine into degrading habitat for the one bird. So say if you had something in there like a wood thrush, they could keep going there every year, but actually they're probably not doing that well. They may be making a nest, it could be getting destroyed by a chipmunk or a squirrel, they'll re-nest and do it again and again. And this is something that we would call a habitat sink meaning that they're not making a surplus population um, in this particular habitat that's going out into the other ones. They're actually losing every time they go there and breed. Um, now some species, like say the great horned owl, they do really good in say a habitat that would be like this, that has a lot of houses, a lot of roads, it's fragmented. Um, they can do pretty good in that. Something like a barred owl, they don't do that good. Um, they can't, one, they typically can't find cavities in the trees, and two, they are really susceptible to getting hit on the road. I'm sure a lot of people have seen um, barn owls hitting the road, and I'm trying to think, I think it was like two or three years ago, there was a big, maybe it was longer than that, 
there was a big eruption of barred owls that was occurring, and they were just getting annihilated on the roads all over the place. Um, folks was, you know, there was a lot of quite, there was a lot of answers as to why, or I guess hypothesis why that was happening. Some people thought that it was because of the snow, that they were coming out in the roads looking for prey, and that is one thing, because obviously they can hear them a lot better and see them on the, alongside the road, but um, I think it probably what had happened was there was probably a big reproductive year on them for the year before, and those were all juveniles that couldn't find a territory of their own. They were getting pushed out to the submarginal areas, and so they're kind of in these submarginal habitats, like say like a suburban area that aren't ideal for them because all the adults are pushing them out because they don't want them in there, um, and so they're more susceptible to getting hit by cars. I mean that was just a guess I had, but that that's what I was thinking on that. Okay. Yeah. It, 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 those are one of the things that like, I talked, kind of alluded to earlier, is that there's just not a whole body of research on owls out there. So there's still a lot that we don't know about them. You know, do we know, do, do like say our barred owl populations, do they fluctuate in relation to their prey populations, the small, <laughs> small mammals? Um, nobody knows. Um, but just like how that suburban habitat and you know just because the species there isn't all it doesn't mean that the habitat is good when the species is there and it is good habitat especially when we think about a species like owls that requires such large areas when we have good habitat for owls that requires such big areas we also have good habitat for a lot of other species that require those same habitat features but maybe not as much so if we look at rabbits, and if we look at turtles, and we look at pine marns and more turtles, um, by kind of conserving and making sure we have enough available habitat around for all of our owl species, we're also making sure that these species are around here too as well. And I always end it with this picture of this <laughs> innocent kid with his innocent <laughs> owl, because it always reminds me that, you know, to, to to work hard and to make sure that just like the person that drew that owl 30,000 years ago in that cave and was so enamored and captivated by those unique adaptations of that owl being able to turn its head almost 360 degrees that we need to make sure that these species are still around today so children like him, like kids here, like all of us in future generations can hear these sounds that raise the hackles on our back at night, but also make us pretty happy to know that these birds are out here. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I'm just going to end it at that. You had a picture there of um, male and female gray horn owls standing next to each other. I think they were gray horns. I don't yep. know. Yeah. Yeah. And it looked to me like the male was like that one on the cave painting that he was, I mean, no, the female, the one on the right, the female, the big one, um, looked like she might be standing with her back toward us with her hands. Yes, so yeah, she, yes was. she was. Yeah. See yeah. if I can get yeah. that and get back yeah. to it. <coughs> yeah, so they have an adjective, so um, they have, the way their jugular veins are in their neck is they can turn their head, I, I think it's about like, it's not, they can't do it like 360 degrees. I think maybe it's about like close to like 270. Yes. That's how much they can turn their head around. And they, that, that the, the way their jugular veins are on their neck is it prevents them from getting cut off. So, you know, like if us, well, one, we can't do it. But if you twisted it enough in most people's veins, it would, they pass out. You wouldn't be able to do that. But they have that adaptation to be able to turn that head around. Let's see? Yeah. 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 yeah, you're right. It is the female. Bigger ones. Um, they have that ability to actually be able to do that, and so that helps the owl. So if they, you know, say they hear something behind them, like a prey species, they don't actually have to turn around, hop over on the branch. They can just turn their head around like that and still be able to focus on that prey species. But um, but obviously that that, I, that picture in that cave still blows me away. That that's how they decided to draw the owl. Yeah. With its head turned around like yeah. that and not forward because they just thought it was so unbelievably fascinating um, to, to, to draw it that way. No, those are the first human drawings ever made. Yeah. One of them was a long, uh, long time. Here's another question here. I'm fascinated. You said before that they would use cats as a prey animal. 
But the weights on the owls are usually much less than like an ordinary house cat. So do they usually prey on things that are like way more than they do? Well, they're not going to carry mittens away. They, I mean, I keep my they, cat inside. Yeah, they can. Oftentimes they're opportunistic, but you'd actually look at, the only thing that would come and probably get a house cat would be a great horned owl. Mm. Um, a barred owl, uh, probably not, um, unless they were really desperate. I don't think I've ever heard of them going after mm. a house cat, but a great horned owl would, um, mm. and they're, they're big enough. Now, they're probably not going to be able to carry it away, but they'll be able to rip a piece of it, um, you know, be able to rip it up in pieces and then take it away that way. Um, but they're not. I, if you have an outdoor cat, I wouldn't be more. I wouldn't be as worried about the owls as I would be something like a fox Fisher. or coyote. Yeah, or Fisher. My cat stays <laughs> in. Yeah, because they'll, they'll, the coyote and the Fisher, um, and even the fox, they'll take out a cat faster than owl will. But they are opportunistic. Um, so if the, if the, if it presented itself, if the opportunity pre presented itself, they would take it. Hmm. Um, Just curious. Yeah. Yes. Well, do owls have any other um, predator besides cats? Oh, you mean prey or what? Predates on. Yeah, on. Yeah. Well, um, let's see. The smaller owls. I'll talk about both those aspects: what they eat and also what eats them. So, if you think of the smaller owls. And if you think of the bigger owls, the bigger ones tend to, they will eat the smaller ones um, if the opportunity presents itself. Um, so other things that will, will eat them too is sometimes other hawks will get them um, if they're out there in the day. So if another hawk sees an owl out there, they will predate on them. Um, typically don't see, uh, most of the mammals aren't going to be able to get an owl that much at all. Um, the nestlings will get eaten um, yeah, and the eggs, it. so you can't have small mammals that will eat that. So if you think of, like a fisher could get into the cavity and eat the young, um, yeah. you could get yeah. small mammals, so squirrels, chipmunks, they would get in the nest and eat the yeah. eggs. Um, obviously the female wouldn't be there. And another big predator uh, that you find of cavity birds, if you can get in there, and the eggs, and especially the chicks, um, ravens and crows. Um, they're pretty, pretty um, big time predators that uh, oftentimes we don't think of them as preying on other bird species, but um, I've seen it on plenty of occasions and a lot of my coworkers have where they've seen cr uh, crows go into cavities and just start grabbing one chick out of the nest after another and they're bringing it to their own babies and, and eating them. Um, and then, so that's what will eat the owls, but other things that the owl eats are, so your whole series of small, you know, kind of your mice, your voles, um, chipmunks, red squirrels, gray squirrels, other songbirds that you see out there, smaller birds like blue jays, robins, um, they'll eat those, um, they'll eat salamanders, frogs, um, snakes, um, pretty much Anything that they can get their hands on that comes in close enough range to them, they'll take. Like I said, they, they wait. If there's an opportunity there, they're going to take it. They're not. They're not picky. They're definitely not picky eaters. Yes. Can you say something about crows mobbing owls? Oh yeah. Both uh, all the birds in the in the corvid family, so your blue jays and your crows, um, tend to mob owls, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen that where. Basically mobbing is, one of the crows will spot the owl, they'll start calling to their compadres, and they all come in and they start kind of pretty much attacking the owl and trying to push it out of there. Um, because they, don't, they see the owl um, as a potential predator of themselves and a competition to themselves too as well. Um, and same thing with the blue jays, and they alert everything else that there's a predator around and they try to push them out of there. Um, but you'll see that, so the crows and blue jays, they'll do that with most raptors that you see. So, um, you know, your red tails, your sipiters, or your coopers or sharp shin hawks, you'll see that quite a bit. So when you're out in the woods and you start hearing like the blue jays making a ruckus, or you hear the crows making a ruckus, like keep your eyes open because chances are you're either going to see the hawk or the owl that they're going after. And I've had that happen uh, countless times. You know, I remember one time I was with one of my coworkers, and I just started hearing the crows go off. And I said, "Wait!" I'm like, "We're going to see something." And here comes a barred owl poof, flying right down, and the crows are right behind it. 
Um, so yeah, that happens quite a bit. And crows can be, you know, they can they can be pretty rough, um, especially in the winter time when they have huge flocks of them. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate it.